Okay, in uh, this session, we're going to just get ourselves a little bit familiar with the Abacus CAE interface. Um, so we're just going to do a little example problem, um, just mostly to familiarize ourselves. Um, so we're going to do a round tensile bar. So what we're going to do is we're going to launch Abacus CAE. Remember, I like to minimize this command prompt. And one of the other things to do is go ahead and open up to your um, Abacus temp directory that you've created. Um, and we're going to see that some files are going to get generated in this location once Abacus boots up. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and start the session with a standard explicit model. Uh, again, first things first, uh, I like to set my... Uh, my view manipulation, I again prefer the Unigraphics NX uh, option, but I recommend uh, to set that to something. Um, I'm also going to choose to make my icons a little bit bigger. And so, also within options, we can come in here and we can scale these up a ways. And so, I'm going to go ahead and move myself up to a scale factor of two. And as you know, I'll have to restart my session for those to take effect. A lot bigger now should help us be able to see everything that's going on and things that I'm clicking. Okay, so um, also kind of first things first is there's you can drag a few things around, um, and uh, um, one of them is that there's these view bars, um, and so you can kind of reselect and drag around things and kind of auto populates your toolbars with what you want filled out. And so what I'm going to go ahead and do is turn off a few of these that I don't typically use. Um, so I'm just going to pull them off and then, um, and then un uh, just remove them out. Um, and let's see. I think that's probably good. But one of the things you might have saw is that I lost my little view orientation. So if you want a toolbar, you come up to the view and then under toolbars, and then you can select the toolbar. So for instance, I can pick out my views again. And I can just carry this thing around. Um, other things too that I'll point out is that this uh, command prompt down here, one is like just printing off uh, information and the other is a Python uh, application programming interface or API. And so this is a this is a Python interface. We can do stuff like import numpy if we choose to. We could set things like a equals numpy uh, dot array and we could create a numpy array uh, in here. Um, so just wanted to show that, that that's an option um, uh, here. And so as you become more advanced in Abacus, you'll be able to start using Python to automate some of your Abacus routines. But we're not going to really touch with, with much of that uh, in this class. OK. Um, so. Um, but one of the things I want to really point out is that there is a model tree on the left. And so there's really two big items. There's models and analysis. And so underneath analysis, you can do stuff like monitor jobs uh, if you're running multiple. Um, and you can also see various models. So oftentimes it's useful to, say, take a model that's maybe you've used one t modeling technique or numerical analysis method, and you can copy that model to a new to a new model and then modify just like a few things in there. And so I use this quite often to try to keep a coherent train of thoughts in something. Um, but uh, we're just going to go ahead and just work with a single model. Um, and then again, there's a whole bunch of items uh, within that, that tree. Um, so the next thing is that there are modules in Abacus. And so if you do the drop down, you can see that there's from part through sketch, there are multiple different modules. And as just if we cycle through these from property to assembly, we can see that both the toolbar on the top as well as the icons on the module tree are changing. And so um, really what that just is, is it's changing kind of like the commands that are at your readily at your ready disposal. Not all of the icons or not not all the functionalities you can do have icons for them. Um, and so sometimes you have to come up to the taskbar and find a very specific 
So for instance, like this mid-surface functionality um, uh, for a tool that you need. Um, other common things too, um, we'll, get, we'll go through a few of these things up here. Um, but let's go ahead and let's make a dog bone tensile. So I'm going to create a part and I'm going to make an actually symmetric part. We're going to call this, not sorry, not a dog bone, but a round tensile bar. So I can give something like a name, I can call it axisymmetric and a base feature of a shell and my approximate sketch size, which I'll leave at about 200. And so that 200 is actually the dimension of this outer sketch area. And so if you were to model something that was larger than 200 now, you'd have your sketch off the edges of this uh, uh, kind of sketch area, sketch grid, and some things just won't show up. Um, you also notice that because we chose actually symmetric, it's auto-generated for us a a construction line right on x equals zero um, and it's also applied a constraint to fix it. One of the things I like to do is always create myself an, you know, an xy. I'm going to go ahead and I could click and put points around if I wanted. Um, I can also control z to undo things in a sketch but also I can type in to this bottom my actual coordinates that I want. So you can see I've created a vertex there. I'm going to use my constraint uh, option to make it uh, fixed. I want to fix that point at zero, zero. And so then I'll click done. And then I'm going to create a con another construction line to go uh, at the y equals zero mark. And so we can see now I've got a coincident um, constraint, a fixed constraint for this x equals zero, and then a horizontal constraint for this horizontal line. Uh, we're going to then Go ahead and start creating our tensile bar. One of the things I want to watch as I'm doing this is that there's going to be some lines that are going to be yellow and some lines um, are going to be green. And so the lines that are green are going to be these construction lines. And we're just going to start kind of putting these in. One of the key, or uh, one takeaway or point would be that um, I can kind of click and drag and kind of see like an, um, constraints are kind of auto populating. Um, so that's kind of a neat little feature that Abacus has. Um, and let's do this. Um, and then we know we're going to have some sort of, of fillet from this top into this bottom. Okay. So this is a crude model of our tensile bar. And we're going to go ahead and try to make this a little bit more pleasing to look at. So we're going to do another constraint. So we're going to pick a, um, well, maybe I won't do a constraint yet. Um, so what I've got is I've got a gauge length and um, let's go ahead and make this um, so I've added the construction line here and maybe I want to make that horizontal as well so I can apply a horizontal constraint and choose and so watch this construction line turn from yellow uh, there and then if I apply a distance on this horizontal line and for this it's going to be a gauge length of 8 my construction line has turned 8 because it's no longer modifiable. The radius of my gauge section here is going to be uh, 0 0.8. So it's going to come down quite considerably. So as you can see, we're starting to get some things that are not looking quite right. So I'm going to try to see if I can open up a little bit more to my drag entities option. We're going to try to make this circle a little bit more pleasing to look at. We're going to add a dimension to this circle and the radius of this, so this is actually the fillet and its radius is 0 0.8. So as you can see things are really starting to kind of look wonky and that kind of speaks to the importance of trying to get the initial dimensions accurate at the start. And sometimes you find yourself that you just have to kind of go through and decide, you know what, I need to delete so I'm going to choose this little delete uh, icon and then just maybe delete some things out um, that don't just don't look quite right um, so I want to get rid of this line here and you're seeing I'm having a hard time selecting it selecting this construction line so I can click and drag select um, and then I can control drag select to unselect that construction line so I can delete just that line I drew all right so let's go ahead and drag uh, this, this fillet uh, circle up to here. We know um, we need 
a uh, reduced length section. So we're going to add a single line from here, from the gauge section up to the um, up a little ways, and then let's add a a constraint to make this point of our circle coincident to this point on our circle. We go ahead and reduce this. I can then add a tangency on this fillet uh, to um, uh, this vertical line that represents our reduced uh, length section. All right, and then um, what we're going to do is we're going to we want this to be a little bit more fillety looking, so we're just going to drag this back a little bit. As you noticed, so I've got some green lines here. And that again means I cannot modify these green lines, but these yellow lines I can change. So you can see I can change still this, um, the height, that length of that uh, reduced length section. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to apply a uh, length for our reduced uh, gauge section, and its length is 0 0.5. All right, and now we're going to go ahead and now it's starting to come a little bit clear. We'll add our grip section. We'll take it into our center line, and then we'll connect this back down. All right, so now what we just need to do is we just need to specify the length of the grip. So we're going to specify um, the length of the grip to be 1.2. And we're going to specify then the radius of the grip. Uh, let's see, what's it going to be? Uh, sorry. Um, so what we need to do is actually this length here of the gauge section is actually four. So one of these options here is to edit dimension value. So we're going to pick this eight. We're going to change it to four. Let's go ahead and let's drag just so we can see this a little bit clearer. We'll bring it in. So I'm using the scroll bar to zoom in, and you'll notice that depending on where I put my mouse, I can zoom in to different regions. So if I want to zoom in, specifically right up here, I can put my mouse there and then use my scroll bar to zoom in. And then lastly, we're going to set this dimension here to be a uh, dimension of 8. Or we're not. Um, so the radius of this top dimension, or this top surface here, is 1.2. All right, and so there we can see we've got the entire geometry has been fully constrained with all of our dimensions and constraints. So now we're going to go ahead and say that we are done. So one of the things that also is that you can either be like clicking on done, but you can also use your, if you have a three wheel or three button mouse, you can use your middle button to, to set things to being done. Here we've gotten some error about not being closed uh, for this feature. So we need to just um, take a look at this. So we can see we've got some body up here that we've forgotten to clean up. All right, so there we've created our axisymmetric model. Uh, you can see we've got some really coarse faceting of our geometry. So if you want that to be a little cleaner within view, you can change your part display options, and you can say choose an, an extra fine uh, mesh refinement. And we can see now we've got a lot finer resolution there. All right, so we've defined a part. Next thing to do is to define a, uh, properties. So we just go down one module. And then we're going to create a material. We're going to call this steel. And then we're going to give it a elastic modulus befitting steel. We also then create a section to assign that material to. So I have to call we'll call this steel solid homogeneous. And so essentially, we've defined some material, but we haven't defined how it's going to be represented or what kind of geometry it's going to be applied to. So say you might be applying steel to like a shell element or to a beam element, or you might be doing it in a some sort of generalized plane strain element or in a, an Eulerian simulation. But here we're going to do a, a homogeneous um, a uh, homogeneous uh, uh, solid section. Then we're going to choose steel. If we'd created multiple steels, we could have chosen that. If we say needed a different material, there's usually icons oftentimes that'll let you kind of pop out of this out of your edit boxes and create whatever's needed um, to proceed. 
And lastly, we're going to create a sec or we're going to assign that section to our part. And so you can see you can name your sections down here. I like to give these um, sections names. So we'll call this uh, steel section. And so we can select our geometry, highlights in red, and then we can hit done. And so then we can make sure that we've got all of our sections applied correctly. And then it'll turn green for us. So the next step we're going to do is we're going to instance this part in our assembly. And so we click the create instance and we choose our part, round tensile bar, and insert. Uh, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to create our step. And so we're going to go into uh, create our step. So we're going to do it after our initial step. Um, we're going to call this just static load. We're going to choose of all the different kinds of simulations we could do, we could also do buckling and frequency types analyses, which we'll cover in a later uh, session. But we're just going to choose like their general static analysis. And we're going to just keep all of these uh, defaults um, as is. We're not going to change anything. We'll talk more about this NOGEOM uh, setting and other settings. Um, if we wanted to, we could also change the field outputs that we would get. Um, we could modify the default uh, field output settings if we wanted to. But we're not going to do that today. We could also change our history output if we wanted. So next thing we're going to do is we just go down the line and we can create interactions. So this is where if you say had some sort of contact, you could add uh, a contact to your to your model. Um, but we don't have contacts in this case. But if you had done that, you would also then create, say, some sort of contact. You might have also created like a film condition, such as like convection or something like that. Um, this is also where you could apply a constraint to say tie two dissimilar meshes together, or create a rigid body out of one of your meshes, or also multi-point constraints. So we're going to go down to the next module, which is load. And here we see we've got icons for creating loads, creating boundary conditions, and creating predefined fields. Uh, this one's useful for if you're restarting a simulation with some other simulation data, you could pre-populate like a stress state, like initial stress state. You could also, if you're doing like a temperature or a heat transfer analysis, you, you'll need to, you might need to specify the initial temperature of certain regions in your model, and you would do that through uh, predefined fields. So here what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and create some boundary conditions. We're going to do, so the actually symmetric boundary condition is already held for us in the kind of model that we're running. So we don't need to apply a boundary condition on uh, this uh, height axis. But since we are doing a half symmetry model, we do need to specify um, half symmetry down here. So we're going to call this half symmetry for our boundary condition. We'll apply it at the initial load, and we're going to choose the type being a symmetry condition. And so we're going to choose um, our midsection, and so we're going to, I'm going to even give this a name, call this midsection. Again, so it's easier for me to come back to later and tell what kinds of things I'd made. And then it's going to be symmetric about Y. And so as we can see, it's telling us that displacement in the second direction, which is X, Y, uh, is going to be zero. The rotation around X is going to be zero, and the rotation around Z is going to be zero as well. And we're going to hit OK. If we'd had a different coordinate system, we could also create a coordinate system and choose a different coordinate system. And we can see that Abacus has now kind of given us some helper feedback about what kind of boundary condition it's applied. And you can see it's, it's telling you the constraints. Uh, the blue stands for rotation, the blue arrows are rotation, and the orange uh, cones are for uh, uh, translations. All right, and then what we're going to do is we're going to say um, we could we'll go ahead and create a load. I suppose um, we could create a boundary condition for like a displacement on the top surface. But let's go ahead and create a load, and we'll just call this uh, pull. And we're going to create a pressure on this top surface. We could also create moments or concentrated forces. So if we choose this, we're going to see that it's going to allow us to create a surface. Um, and we're going to go ahead and choose this top surface. It highlights it for us. Let's call this gauge top. Sorry, not gauge top. We'll call this uh, bar top. Uh, 
Okay. And then we're going to go ahead, well, let's say we apply a load of, say, 100. And then you see up here there's a distribution. So we can have a uniform pressure distribution, which would tell us like how many PSI. Uh, it can also be hydrostatic. One of the things, too, is that, um, um, well, yeah, so we'll do it here, hydrostatic. So 100 PSI of force. If we hit OK, we'll see that the arrows are pointing into the surface. So a good point to bring up is that pressure in abacus, positive pressure, is defined to be into the surface. So this is going to push on our surface. The arrows denote that. So maybe we want to go ahead, we want to change that from being a push to a pull. So we go in and we can edit. And if we make a negative 100, we'll see that those arrows will flip themselves around. All right, so once we're happy with setting up our uh, boundary conditions, the next step is to go to mesh our part. And so we need to be meshing not the assembly, but the individual parts themselves. You'll notice that this part is now turned to pink uh, for context aware, for what it's able to do, uh, for what Abacus is able to do. And if we were to, say, choose mesh controls, we could see that we could do different sorts of meshes, so like a tri-meshing or quad dominated, so it might allow a single triangle, or we can choose to do quad meshing. We can see it allow us to do, say, a structured mesh if we were to choose. Um, it would all turn green. Uh, otherwise, the defaults right now are, are free. It's telling us that essentially Abacus is having a little bit of difficulty telling how to mesh this part. Um, so we can apply an initial uh, seed size to the edges. So you, oftentimes the default is a really good coarse representation of your mesh. So I usually like to start with that and then decide to mesh the part um, and see what I end up getting out. So you can see it's quad dominant, so I've got a single triangle in there. That's maybe not what I want. So maybe I want to assign a fully quad mesh to this part. And Abacus will ask if I want to delete my mesh. And I'll tell it, don't give me this warning again. And you see now, here is a fully quad mesh. And the quality here is not very good. And so one of the things that we're going to do, and we'll talk more about this later in future lectures, is we're going to go ahead and partition our geometry to help ourselves get a really good clean mesh in here. So I'm going to choose to modify this face. And so um, I'm choosing to make a sketch as my uh, decomposition. So I'm just going to do some just quick lines here. And we'll talk more about what these uh, options are uh, in a future lecture. OK, so we've chosen those as, our, as kind of our options. And uh, let's go ahead and even maybe I'll make a, uh, a further um, uh, partition here like that. All right. So here's my mesh. And let's go ahead and turn a few of these into, well, I need one more actual decomposition. So one of the things we can see, we'll talk about, is that in our model tree, we can see our part, our round tensile bar, and it has features. And so we can see our first feature was this shell, with this planar shell with a sketch. And then I partitioned. Uh, uh, the tensile bar and it has a base feature of a sketch. So let's go ahead and modify this sketch by double clicking on it and we'll add a few more lines just to propagate um, that partition through. And then we will uh, regenerate the features. Okay, so now we're going to go ahead and choose our regions of the model to apply meshing techniques to. So we're going to choose structured techniques for those regions and then if able to um, we'll let it do um, uh, maybe a structured mesh in that region as well so again we'll seed our part we'll mesh our part and it's not too bad we could go ahead and choose to seed certain edges so maybe we want to make sure that we have equal amounts of elements through this width here so we can select both of those edges and click done and then maybe we want to make sure that we have uh, at least four elements um, so I guess two elements in each would give us four elements throughout the entire gauge width um, and you can set a constraint to say allow the elements to only increase all right so if we recreate the mesh now we can see that here's our new mesh 
And uh, a few other notes too is that there is a um, option to assign a mesh type to everything. So if you wanted a higher order mesh, you could choose say quadratics. You could also change your formulation. And the formulation definition is described at the bottom. So as we select options or turn off options, uh, we can see various different things uh, turn on and off. So we'll go ahead and we'll use just the default uh, reduce integration elements. Um, I should probably mention this also that uh, uh, here, if we were doing different kinds of analyses, like a heat transfer, you have to change the family of elements that you were choosing from, as well as standard or explicit. All right, so we've defined a mesh that we're, say, relatively okay with, although I have decided that I'm going to go ahead and turn this from a structured mesh to a free mesh and see what Abacus is able to do uh, for me there. And that's a much better mesh, actually. So we'll go ahead and proceed with this geometry. So after we've meshed, we're now ready to run a job. So we switch down to the job module, and we'll see that we can create a job. And let's call this tensile bar axisymmetric. And then we're going to reference that model that we'd created. If you had a full version of Abacus, you could choose to change, uh, to say, have multi-processors uh, running this. Um, but we're just going to go ahead and choose the defaults. So that's created uh, a job object. And then what we can do is we can go ahead and, uh, if we were running on a high-performance computer, we might just simply write our input, and that would write it to our temp directory. So we can see our .imp file, uh, which we can go ahead and open up. And so we can see that we've got text that defines our uh, elements and node positions, as well as the actual simulation information like the assembly, the materials that we've assigned, uh, as well as our load cases and uh, boundary conditions. Um, and so we're going to go ahead and Again, if you're running on a supercomputer or high-performance computer with queues, you may not want to submit a job and then have it error out. And you might wait in a queue for a long time just to find out that you had some simple mistake. So we can run a data check on this option or on this uh, job. And we can track the monitor, um, which monitors our job. And we can uh, kind of see various different files or outputs from, say, errors or warnings associated with our model. And so we don't see any here. Um, but you can just kind of peruse through these. You can get a data file from the results of the initial uh, simulation or of the initial data check and some messaging about your, about your simulation model. And again, these files get written out to that temp directory. And so this data file corresponds to this .dat file. The message file corresponds to the .msg file. Um, so those are sometimes useful ones to open up on the side. We're going to go ahead and submit this job. And we can track in the monitor, which will tell us how our job has been proceeding. We can see that it's solved in a single step and is completed successfully. Once it's completed successfully, we can choose to view the results. And the module changes from job to visualization. So we'll just go over a few things here. Um, so. First of all, kind of the three big options are to either plot just your mesh on an undeformed shape to plot the deformed shape, but still just the mesh, or you can plot contours of your deformed variables on them. And so here we're plotting stress on our primary variable, whereas the deformed variable is, is u. So if we wanted to say, in this case, plot by von Mises, but if we wanted to plot, say, uh, the 2-2 component of our stress tensor, we could plot that as well, um, as well as our maximum principles, and we just change through the colors. So those are the different components of the stress tensor that's output. We also see our displacement, either as a magnitude or in specific directions or dimensions. Um, if we didn't want to plot, sometimes it's useful to not plot on a deformed shape, but to plot on the undeformed shape. So you can choose to click and hold on Anything with a little arrow, you can click a hold, and then we can choose the undeformed shape. Let's go ahead and plot in the deformed shape. Now, you might be asking yourselves why this looks like it's got such a large deformation. 
one of the options, so under common options, uh, is to have a scale factor of your deformation. And Abacus tries to pick a human pleasing value, so in this case it scaled our displacement by about 15,000. Sometimes that can be very useful, but it can also be a bit deceiving. So it's oftentimes useful to go in and specify a uniform displacement of just one and show the real displacement. Um, but we'll go back because um, it sometimes is, again, it's useful to see what the actual deformation or uh, what the mode of deformation is. Uh, if you have a very dense mesh, sometimes it can be very hard to see um, any results because it'll just be all black lines. So we could choose to just plot feature edges and we just see like an outline. Um, and then again, there's a whole bunch of other various different things that you can set in here. Um, so you could change like the thickness of lines uh, if you wanted to get um, either your mesh lines bigger or like your parts external lines bigger. Um, and uh, you can also sometimes shrink elements, which is kind of a fun thing to do sometimes. Um, so you could shrink elements and show um, them kind of out and uh, broken out. Um, it's kind of a fun, fun little tip. Um, and then what we're gonna do now is just show, um, say, animation. So in this case, we only have a single output, and we just want to see uh, kind of this this output at this time, and we just want to see its mode of deformation. So we're gonna just change the scale factor. So we're gonna choose this button, or this option to animate by scale factor as opposed to time history. Um, and then under options, we can choose to have this swing back and forth. And we can also choose to have, say, multiple frames. So say we wanted 30 frames per second video uh, to, to last three seconds. Well, if we were to specify 90 frames, that would then give us a uh, three second video outputting at 30 frames per second. And we can see here then our scale factor varying from zero to one. Um, if we'd had history output, we could choose to create XY data and we could pick out some history output and then make a, a simple line graph. We could also create field output. So let's go ahead and create some field output. I'm going to turn back on my, uh, my mesh. Um, also, it's kind of hard to see sometimes some of these things with just with the background. So if we go to view in graphic options, we can choose to have a solid viewport background and maybe to have white. And you see Abacus automatically changes then my text to black. So let's create XY data on the field output. Um, we're going to choose maybe a, a um, unique nodal. So that'll allow us to query, say, displacement of a node. And we're going to choose U2. And uh, then we're going to select from viewport edit selection, let's choose this node here. And we'll save that. Um, and uh, so we can plot that displacement um, from time zero to time one and its maximum displacement, which you can see is somewhere around about uh, 45 um, E minus six. We could also say choose to pull out um, a uh, um, an element an element value so it's like say stress so let's maybe say let's grab the uh, stress in the uh, y y dimension let's go ahead and choose our element um, so we need to swap back to the deform state and let's maybe pull this element down here so edit selection choose this element. And we can plot its that element stress um, at each of its nodes um, over time. And so the last little thing we can do is we can open up the manager. And so if we wanted to say specifically plot node 10 as computed from element 50. So as you know, uh, stress values at the nodes are discontinuous. So you, uh, node 10 has a uh, unique stress value whether it's coming from element 50 or say element 49 if it's next to it and so we can choose to say uh, create some new data from this XY data so operate on XY 
continue and we can combine so we click, click on a, the operator combine we'll choose you to be our X so we double click on that put a comma in and then double click on uh, this value here and let's just call it uh, stress verse displacement and again we can uh, then uh, plot this value. So now we can see we've now got stress in an element over the displacement uh, that the top of the tensile bar is seeing. Um, so if we come back here we can choose to auto fit to view. Um, something that's also quite useful to do is again this is actually symmetric and it's kind of hard to see sometimes what the actual part is. So there's ODB display options that we can choose. And we can choose to uh, do a sweep. So we can sweep our elements say from 0 degrees to a, a full 360 and maybe we want to have 36 segments around. And so now we can start to see the tensile bar take place. Maybe we want a little bit of a cutout so maybe we change this to 270 degrees um, as our rotation. So now you can see you can see the internal stress state but also get some idea for the actual physical dimensions. But also we had a symmetry condition. So let's go ahead and we're going to mirror this geometry in the x over the xz plane. And we can hit apply here. Now we see we've got a full tensile bar. So this is a very useful functionality to be able to see parts that you've applied um, symmetry boundary conditions to um, either implicitly through axisymmetric or explicitly through the explicit specification of a boundary condition. Uh, the last thing I want to show um, or just remind is that we can save these CAE files and they get saved as a .CAE is the extension so we'll call this tensile bar. Uh, if we would wanted to uh, which we will. Let's go ahead and give ourselves um, some videos here. So we'll choose in the XY dimension. We'll give ourselves a parallel projection. Um, and uh, we'll go ahead and we could either use the print to save a picture. So we can save to file. And we can call this just simply um, tensile bar and then choose to save it as a PNG. So we'll hit apply. And we could also, under the animate option, choose to save an animation. And again, we can choose AVI, call this tensile bar again. If you do save an, uh, an animation, I do recommend that you choose AVI, uh, and then you change the compression codec to Microsoft Video 1, change the quality to 100, configure um, the compressor to be a temporal quality ratio of 1. And those are, I think, pretty good settings. Again, we mentioned that we wanted to have 30 frames per second for a 3 second video. And then we'll click Apply. And it tells us we've saved our video. Um, so now we can see we have both a PNG of our results. as well as a video of our results. Which is, because I'm doing a screen record, I'm having some issues playing in AVI, but that is a, uh, a video. Um, all right, so that's uh, kind of today's uh, run through walkthrough. Actually, there's one more thing. Um, so sometimes you have a question about what's going on. This little, uh, um, question mark thing up here or icon here is context sensitive help so say say that you're in something like say property and you're say creating a composite uh, layup and you really don't know what these things mean so if you click this button you can then click on a region and it'll bring you to the uh, region in the help documentation um, I do recommend that you, you need, I think you're Chrome doesn't work, you're going to need to use either Internet Explorer or Microsoft Edge 
Um, so if we use Microsoft Edge and we paste that link, um, we can use this to get our um, or access the user documentation. Um, so clearly here we've had a few issues, although I think this is primarily because I don't have Edge set up as my um, default browser. But we could browse through the help if we wanted. Um, and they have a really good extensive help um, for Abacus. Um, and so I kind of recommend that you um, rely on this to help you out with some stuff. You could also have gotten to that through help and then search and browse guides. All right, um, that concludes uh, this session.